previews, predictions, X Factors, season preview. We got so much to talk about on the next episode of the Messed Up Podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by Aura. Are you tired of receiving spam phone calls to the point where you don't even want to answer your phone anymore? That's because data brokers sell your information to scammers and spammers and anybody else who may want to target you. That's right, your full name, your home address, your health records, it's all out there. That's why we've been using Aura. Aura shows you which data brokers are selling your information and automatically submits opt-out requests on your behalf. Not only does this stop scammers and hackers from getting and using your information, but it also protects you from them using that information to get into your social media accounts or bank accounts too. Aura is always on duty, looking to keep you safe so you can focus on anything else you need to focus on with peace of mind. So stop data brokers from exposing your personal information to that and visit our sponsor at aura.com backslash messed up. That's aura.com backslash messed up to get a 14 day free trial and see how much of your data is being sold. We value privacy here in the Met Stub podcast, and there's no better way to ensure your safety online than by using Aura. Thank you, Aura, for sponsoring today's episode. What is up, Mets fans? Welcome back to the season preview episode of the Met Stub podcast. <laughs> put, some, put some sirens, whether it's me or James doing the editing here, there's going to be some Jamaican air horns. Like, ooh, 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 whatever uh, it is going on bah, in the bah, background. Bah, bah. But we have got the season preview here for you guys. We're going to be talking about every player, every single thing that could possibly happen this year. X-Factors, predictions, expectations, roster construction, all that stuff that you would want to hear from a season preview episode. That's exactly what you're going to get. So uh, let me do the quick plug here before we get going into about probably an hour plus worth of yapping about this team. So strap in if you're in the car. Maybe you'll catch this one on the way to work and on the way back. But regardless, if you like what you're listening to over here, make sure you are following us on all our social media at Mets Up on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, as well as subscribe to the Mets Up Podcast YouTube channel if you want to see the video version of this. And if you're liking what you're listening to, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, drop us a rating, drop us a review, download, and subscribe. Remember, during the season, we will be dropping at least two episodes a week. One at the end of every single series will be coming out as soon as the series pretty much ends. Me and James will record that. And then there might be some just special stuff dropped uh, here and there randomly with whatever's going on. Now that we're not with the team, we can do whatever we want. So we plan on doing kind of whatever we want. Um, and over on the YouTube channel, you guys are going to get some exclusive content over there as well. That will not necessarily be a podcast episode. Like when we go to games, we're going to vlog or doing some quizzes, whatever it is, a lot of content. That's my spiel. Now, let's start talking about some baseball. James, you excited? You ready to get going into this? I'm so excited. I'm even like more excited because the last episode, the late night JD Martinez episode, I definitely had a few. I was out that night. <laughs> shout out um, shout out the other half in Brooklyn. Shout out Rates and Barrels podcast. Shout out Nick Pollock. I went out with Nick and Eno Saris and Derek Van Riper. A couple of the baseball people, people I've been like reading and listening to for years and years. So very cool to like spend time like socially and talk baseball with them. But was out for a while. Jay, I was just at JD Martinez happened. We were all together. So it's cool being around a bunch of already drunk baseball people, half Mets fans. When you're like that team signs JD Martinez, people are talking about contract, people are talking about fit, people are talking about expectations. It's cool to just be in that environment. And then came back, it was a little nuts. So happy to really hunker down right now and focus up on a real thorough, thick season preview of the Mets. Yeah. And as you said, uh, you know, in the notes and as we talked about in the episode with J.D. Martinez, this is like the shot in the arm that the Mets kind of needed going into the season because there I don't want to say that there's been a malaise. We like to use that term a lot over here, but like crawling into the end of spring training, every single team's doing it. You're just like, we want the real games to start and getting that J.D. Martinez contract that we've been waiting for all offseason. Mets fans have been clamoring for dying for getting finally like pen put to paper. Going into the season, Grant D won't be here for opening day, but it does just give you a little bit more excitement now, a little bit more buzz around this team for one that maybe doesn't have the highest expectations, but I think both of us are cautiously optimistic about so far this year. It's not even just the expectations for us, the fans, because this was definitely a big deal for us. Everyone, every Mets fan, I think, was very excited about this, besides the weird 5% Mark Vientos hive, which we'll talk about in briefly yeah. in a little bit. But even you heard Pete and Lindor saying it, like, oh, this yep. is a cool thing. Like, this is one, this is like, all right, we know this guy, J.D. Martinez. He's 30, he's 30 and 100 guy every single year. Around baseball, he's an all-star. Everyone knows that. He's been called a hitting savant, which is a really cool thing. They're excited to have him in the locker room. But two, it's just kind of like a... It's like a stamp of approval off for the this roster from Davis Sir as the front office. Like, I think you guys can win. This player who's an all-star thinks you guys can win. So everyone's going to come together now. Now this is just like a push for everybody in the right direction. Again, excitement for the fans is one thing, but it's like now I think there's even more of an enhanced belief from this team, which I'm sure they have already. They're professional athletes. They've been all saying all the right things all offseason, all spring. Like, we know it's not like last year, uh, expectations-wise. We still think we have a lot of good players in this locker room. Still have a lot of guys who have won or are used to winning. 
everything seems to be pushing the Mets towards a team that's, again, probably better than people expect. And the fan graphs uh, prediction, predictions that were out after the J.D. Martinez signing, and they have us at exactly 81 and 81, which is right in the mix of the NL wildcard spot, two games behind the Giants and the Diamondbacks for the last spot with the Cubs one win ahead of us, but one win behind the Giants and Diamondbacks. And I think it's such a really fun spot to be in, one that – is like this to me feels more Mets. I feel like as Mets fans, we've gotten away from what makes us feel Mets these last few years of Steve Cohen because we were like, we're top dogs. We could do anything we want, sign anybody we want. We're expecting 100 wins a year after it happened literally exactly one time without any wins in a playoff series or one <laughs> win in a playoff series without advancing around. And Mets fans definitely got a little bit spoiled. But this is this is Mets shit now where we have a ragtag bunch of dudes. We have a couple stars supplanting it. We don't know where some of the production is going to come from. We got a one big signing now after the entire off scene is going to be a big part for us. And it's just let's just play baseball and see if we could pick some people off and have some fun this summer. Yeah, and I mean, even if you're looking at the gambling odds, like the Mets are 81 and a half wins, according to a certain sports book, which will not be named. If they want to be named, they can pay us. We will take sponsorship. We will be happy to take your money, but we won't name you because you're not paying us. But yeah, they're at 81 and a half. And that has been, I think, the thing that both of us have really said this whole whole entire offseason that, that this is a 500 Mets team. Like on paper, you can look at it and you can say this is a team that's going to win 81 games, but they have the ability to be four or five wins above that, four or five wins below that. That's kind of the range is like that 78 to 84, 85 wins. And that 81 feels like a really normal place, very comfortable place. Like you said, for us Mets fans, as we know, we had been a little bit, we, we, we were feeling hot. We were feeling hot. Mojo, really? You got to shake while I'm talking right here? Come on. <laughs> thought you were sitting down, but still watching the dog for those of you uh, at home listening. Still watching the dog. And of course, he decides to make a ton of noise. But at the end of the day, this Mets team's expectations have been calmed, but I don't think it's a bad place to be, especially because there are a lot of good players on this roster, especially on the offensive side. A lot of really good guys out there. Very much. I think even before we talk about the guys on the roster, we should again briefly talk about the weekend and the guys who are not on the roster, mainly the fact that Mark Fientos will not make this team, or at least to start the season, he will not make this team. And it was definitely a bit of a strange vibe because they signed JD in his first, in Fientos' first at bat after signing JD Davis, JD Martinez, Jesus Christ, JD Davis. Oh my God, that was a real Freudian oh slip there. But. Fietos hits a home run the next at bat. And I think it was off of, was it Libertor? I don't know. It was another like just soft toss and quadruple A guy where it was like, Vientos is ready for the call, blah, blah, blah. And I think it was an assumption that he would probably be the opening day DH and get these first 10 days while J.D. Martinez is getting some run in Syracuse to get up to speed in his timing. But he got sent down the next day for Zach Short, who's going to make the club. And beautiful moment for Zach Short. I don't know if many Mets fans saw this or caught this on Twitter, SNY, Jenny Mets had it, where... Saturday morning when these roster cuts were being made, or Sunday morning, Saturday morning, Sunday morning, it was Sunday morning, Zach Short found out his grandma had passed away. Sad thing. I've got grandmas out there. I love my grandma. Mark's, Mark and Mark has, yeah, yeah, I had a grandma. Tough year for him oh, last yeah. year. But he said, and he grew up a Mets fan in the New York City area, and that she was a Mets fan as well. And then he said two hours after getting that news, he found out he made this team. And I'm sure Zach Short went most of this offseason really not thinking he had much of an opportunity to make this club. He was signed, I even believe, before Ronnie Mauricio tore his ACL. So that was a guy ahead of him. Jo Joey Wendell had the guaranteed contract. He was ahead of him. And then he has all these other guys who could hit better than him who are ahead of him. And then he comes out in spring training. He plays great baseball. He can play multiple positions on the field. And he finds out he makes the team. And he has this really tearful interview. And it's just like, damn, you could really feel that emotion. It's like, that's a... It's a pretty special thing. He even said it was like a very emotional morning, of course, because he probably had like one of his lowest and one of his highest moments he's ever had within two hours of each other. But cool to see him on this team and nice to see him, a guy with a lot of versatility to have that last spot rather than someone like Vientos, who as much as some people like him has become very one dimensional. And that one dimension is something that I think is very overstated as well. Yeah. Super happy for Zach Short. Like you said, Another lifelong Mets fan. Like, it's another cool little story to add to the thing. Uh, love to hear that. And obviously, thoughts go out to him with his family as well with what went on. Um, but that's got to be a little bit of bittersweet news for him. It's like, sad day. Also, probably one of the best days. That's also, I believe, the first time he's ever made the opening day roster Was. for a Major League Baseball team, too. So that's another huge thing for these players. Whether or not he has a huge impact for this team, whatever it's going to be, still a big thing for him. I will say, good little player. Good little player. It just feels like kind of that better Luis Guillorme role, which is something that you kind of need on the bench a little bit. A little bit more pop, a little bit more maybe versatile in the infield in terms of he might not have the better hands, but he can play all the positions well. The other thing I want to talk about too with the Vientos being sent down is how viciously uncomfortable it was 
that they had him answer questions from reporters like that. Would have thought PR would have been on him a little bit more to maybe not have to answer those questions coming out early from a spring training game. Because I feel for Vientos, and I know I've been someone who's been critical of him um, in terms of his play and his production and just what I think of him as a player. But that was that was hard to watch. And Awful. you feel for the guy because obviously he's frustrated. He's sad. Whatever the emotions he's going through, totally justified. Because up until, what, four, five, six days until the season's about to start, he was like, I'm going to make this team and I'm going to have a shot to be the DH. And for all intents and purposes, while he didn't play fantastic, he hit home runs. And that's probably what he was told to do is hit home runs. You have a shot to make this team. And as much as it sucks for him, I do think it's the right decision. I feel bad for him. Um, you could see how uncomfortable it was. But at the end of the day, these are the decisions that I'm glad the Mets are making because it's not about feelings. It's not about vibes or friends or any of that kind of stuff. It's what is going to be the best team that gives us the best chance to win every single game. And I really do think David Stearns and Carlos Mendoza put together that team pretty well. Yeah, I agree with you. But that Viento stuff was weird. Usually, SBR Hard. is much more protective. And I guess to this moment, they were not. But I don't know. I, I do give a lot of credit to J.D. Martinez in this. Like the first thing he did seems like when he had on yep. his sweats and was going for batting practice, put his arm around Mark Vientos. And there are – there's a modicum of similarities to be drawn from between those two guys in their careers. Super. Because J.D. Martinez is another guy who never had a, def a defensive home, has literally his whole career never had a defensive home, never even close to good any defensive position. Took a long time to break out, 26, 27, 28 years old, before he really became an elite hitter with, again, like the Tigers and the Red Sox. And it took a lot of him fixing his – with velocity, learning how to pull the ball more, pull, pull the ball more, a lot of the problems that Viento still had. But it is still just after the spring training, after last year, the long cup of coffee in the major leagues. Not a long cup of coffee. It was a moderate cup of coffee for Viento's major league. Just the issues with him that had just persisted, had not gotten better, which sucks because you see the high end, you see the power, you see the home runs. But I had a tweet from over the weekend about Mark Viento's against velocity, something we talked about a lot on this show last year, that for him to make that jump from minor leagues to the major leagues, he had to get better facing velocity. That's the biggest jump that you're going to see from AAA to the majors. When the major leagues, you're going to face like two or three guys a week that don't throw 95 miles an hour or faster. In the minor leagues, you might face two or three guys in a week that actually throw 95 miles an hour or harder. And last year, after it was called up, Vientos faced 131 pitches of at least 95 miles an hour. His triple slash against those was 184, 273, 447, with a 36% whiff rate, a 42% chase rate, and a 30% zone contact rate. And 97 yeah. of those pitches were fastballs. Vientos did pretty well in sinkers last year. The hard. He hit the big home run of JT Chargois. He hit the big home run of Aroldis Chapman. And I remember one of those 95-mile-an-hour pitches, just because this person's an alien, was off of Joan Duran. And Vientos hit a really yeah. hard ground ball. Wound up being a double play, but he smoked a ground ball, which you could – that's it. And he got a hit off of Felix Bautista too, right? Didn't he? Didn't he, did. he smoke I, a double I, off of him? I think a double off Bautista, yeah. But that was the four-seam fastball. But again, now off the four-seam fastballs because okay. Vientos just – the swing is longer and it's a little – he does a little better lower in the zone because it's such a longer swing. So he's going to be better against the sinker the pitchers with the downward slope than the pitchers with like the fastballs, the upward slope against 97 fastballs, 95 miles an hour faster, 115, 172, 269 triple slash, 42% whiff rate, 48% chase rate, which is ungodly bad, and only a 25% in zone contact rate. It's just, it wasn't good enough. And he spent the offseason working on defense, and it seemed like the spring training did get a little bit better at it. But again, this spring, it was like 4% walks, 30% strikeouts without a defensive home. It's, 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 it's hard. I understand without J.D. Martinez, it made sense for him to be on the roster because you had a high-end power bat from the right side. But if you can't hit velocity, it's hard for you to be a successful major leaguer. And then if you don't offer anything else besides what you can do at the plate, but you have a big hole at the plate, like you just you have to get better to make an impact. And that's not we're not closing the door on Mark Vientos. We're not closing the book on him. No. I, I feel awkward sometimes tweeting this stuff now because now that we've been on the inside and we've met a lot of these guys, and they're all really good guys. Like yeah, seeing the tweet about Vientos having like 150,000 impressions, I'm like, God. I really hope Probably Mark Vientos didn't. That's what I'm saying. Like, there's a good chance Mark Vientos saw this tweet and is like in his locker right now. And I'm one of the reasons that he's like feels like shit. But it's just, I don't know. It's a, we got we to gotta, we gotta get impressions. We got to say the things that when they come up. But it's just, it sucks. He's a good guy. It's just, he's got to get a little bit better. I'm not saying he can't, but right now he isn't. Yeah. Right now he is not good enough to help this team as much as they need. And if he smokes it like he has in the past in AAA, we will see him up at the major league level and he will have the opportunity to make an impact for the team again. The other kind of last final roster spot here that's still up in the air at the time of recording is going to be that last bullpen spot, which seems to be between Michael Tonkin, Sean Reed Foley, and Johan Ramirez, or two, two spots for three guys. Yes. Um, we don't know. We don't know. And to be fair, any way you go, I think is fine. The only thing that sucks is 
you're going to lose one of these guys. Another team's going to pick them up instantly, and they're they're not going to be a Met this season, it seems like. So who do we think probably is going to get those last two spots? I mean, Tonkin, I think, is the one, and then it's between SRF and Johan Ramirez, right? Yeah, again, we probably want to spend like maybe 20 more seconds talking about this because we're 15 minutes yeah, into yeah. the episode, and all, we, all we've talked about is uh, backup relievers, Mark Vientos, J.J. Martinez, and Zach Short. But That's what you I want. Just, <laughs> I talk it, I think, is the lock because he gives – bigger workload floor than like any, most other relievers in his bullpen. And he was just through the most innings of any reliever last year and was pretty good at them. And so I think that's something valuable. Then a part of me still thinks I have the Mets official Twitter account, which has been very active today. The Mets official Twitter account as active as we'll they've been a very long time. Talk about that later. Just ready for that. Like final tweet for the official roster spot. But I, 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 have, I have a sneaking suspicion that maybe they manipulate Tyler McGill because they don't need a fifth mm-hmm. starter for the first couple days of the season. Send him down, keep all the relievers, and just wait for someone to get hurt for a week and then make it make your decision. Or just I know a lot of spotlights going to be on the Mets faking injuries right now, <laughs> but there there probably is a phantom injury that can't be made that pitching staff. But I don't know, Arm maybe fatigue. one. Of the, yeah, it's fatigue. I, I mean, Jorge Lopez velocity was a little down, so was um. So is Deekman's, but I think that might have been them taking it easy in the spring. Same with Drew Smith, but I don't know. If, if I had to pick, I, I would probably pick Tonkin, and uh, I think I would just take Sean Rifoli because commands a little better than Ramirez, and the stuff is still really good, but I, I'd like, I don't know. I'd like all those guys. Even even a reliever the Mets got rid of early in the offseason, Justin Slayton looks amazing for the Red Sox after the Mets picked him up in the Rule <laughs> yeah. 5 draft. He's like a future closer, so I don't know. Maybe they did think this bullpen was quite deep, and with major league guys, it low-key is. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, the, the team's looking good. Now we can actually start talking about the real guys, the the, the actual stuff going on with this team. Oh, One more thing. Uh, we're going to wear a Bud Hit Harrelson me. patch this Ooh, season. Ooh, nice, okay. Which I like, really Very good. good. Yeah, Hon- Honoring an all-time awesome. man. Yeah, we killed the black jerseys, but at least we had the patch, which will be a nice addition because the black jerseys look horrendous right now. I don't know if you guys caught those on Twitter, but they are bad. I, they went from being some of the best jerseys in baseball to one that I would not spend even a cent on. Uh, oh. They look horrible, but. We're not buying any official jerseys this year. It's official uh, official stance of the Messed Up Podcast, DHK. We're not giving them <laughs> our money. Never again. We can't. We can't. We can't do it. Not, not, not one year after they got rid of us. Maybe two years. We'll see how we feel. <laughs> now, me, maybe never again. But now we want to talk about some real stuff. We want to talk about where this Mets team can exceed expectations. What can happen this Mets team to make them good? Who are going to be the X factors? And we've had these conversations before earlier in the offseason. Now we want to talk about it because we're so close. We're like, we're on the razor's edge. And just what... What gets this team to the playoffs? What makes this team win 85 games instead of 81? What could even make them win 87, 88? I'm not even going to say 90 because I think that's crazy. But like, what what what, what, what can be what can be worth those five wins for the Mets? How do we get to the playoffs? I wanted you to ask you what you think is the most important thing possibly to getting this Mets team to the playoffs. Ooh, the, I mean, truthfully, the most important thing is the pitching. Like we we need one of these starting pitchers to step up, and I don't necessarily know if it's going to be like a Manaya. Or uh, let's even say Severino. Like, it might have to be, like, a Christian Scott who comes up late. It might have to be a Mike Vassell. It might have to be Tyler McGill. I think it's more of those back-end guys that we have more question marks about what their actual floor and ceiling looks like rather than the guys like Manaya, Hauser, Severino, where we kind of are comfortable with what they're going to be. Um, and honestly, we need Kodai Senga back as soon as possible. And if we can get him back in May, or if we can, if, let's say June is the earliest that we can get him back, even getting him for those three or four months down the stretch – could very well be the difference between three and four wins for this team over the rest of the season, and that could be 81 wins, 84 wins right there. Uh, it's it's going to be the starting pitching without a doubt. Yeah, I, I, I think I like how you took the ceiling approach because I was going to very opposite take the floor approach. We just need the Hauser, Manaya, McGill, Quintana quadrants to just be acceptable. We can't have we can't have a six ERA at the end of May from any of those guys. It just can't happen. Like maybe someone has one awful start and then like five pretty good ones, so the ERA is six, but it's in process wise more. But we just can't. We we saw last year how much it compounds when starting pitchers don't give length. It was weeks last year before yeah. a mess pitcher completed six innings. You can't have that again. <laughs> you need you need Sean Manaya and you need Adrian Howe. I mean, Manaya is a weird one because we even saw this last spring start where he looked really good, but that last inning he fell apart and his velocity went from ninety four to ninety one. And you could see it last year in the way the Giants used him. And so I've been kind of saying all offseason and when we signed him, that's just he might not be as traditional of a starter as Mets and other people want, but it's just being yeah. able to manipulate him in a way that makes him as efficient as possible. That's why, again, a guy like Michael Tonkin comes in handy and is very good there. That's why a guy like Jose Budo, who's going to be on this roster sooner rather than later, becomes a glue guy for the staff. If Jose Budo, if like if Hauser, Manaya, Budo combine for 400 innings and a 4 2 ERA, that's kind of like you just had what used to be two traditional good back end starters, but you just displaced it to a third guy, but still the same effect at the end of the day, just with an extra roster spot, which they need. 
They're going to need to be creative with the back. Sanga has to come back and he has to be good. And Severino looks looks like an X factor and he's healthy right now. And he was throwing bullets at the end of spring. And he's a guy yeah. I'm just high on in general. I did my bold predictions on Twitter the other day. And I <laughs> like I really think he could be an all-star. Like he's he looks like he has everything that we've been waiting for him to have for a few years. Just please be healthy. And it's just those guys, the back end, even even McGill just just holding it together, just keeping that shoulder attached to the arm. Just everybody there. Pitching good innings, getting through five, sometimes getting through six, two runs on the board, handing it to the bullpen with the game intact. That is going to be so important to this team because I think one of the strengths right now might be the floor of pitching. But again, if two of those these guys fall apart, it's not going to be true anymore. Yeah, and I think I'm just also really confident in this Mets lineup. Like, I think they are a top 10 lineup in Major League Baseball. Is, is that is that a crazy thing to say? I, I think they are because we're, sa- we're saving both predictions especially- for the next segment. Yeah, but I, I at the end of the day, like I think this lineup is going to be really good offensively. Like especially adding JD Martinez now, given that extra length of that lineup, could be really good to the point where I think they're going to be able to score enough runs to win. It's just going to be about limiting now with the pitching, which that's like oh stupid. That's so obvious. That's how baseball works. You got to score more than the other team. But sometimes it's it is that simple, and the lineup is going to be able to score enough runs, especially if some of the other players in that lineup take the step forward or a bounce back like we hope they do. It's just about the pitching, and it's it's super boring. That's like the most boring X factor is like the pitching needs to be good. Like, yeah, no shit. Of course it does. But like, that's the problem with this roster. That was the problem coming in. That was the problem last year. That's been the problem the last few years is getting the pitching down. If we can do that, this is a team that can definitely make the playoffs. Definitely. You'd love J.J. Martinez coming to the lineup, giving extra length. Mark loves extra length. That's his favorite love thing. Love extra length. But yeah. – it's a, again, we'll start with the better. lineup for this to actually be a top 10 lineup. Like you need Pete Nimmo Lindor and JD Martinez to all be something like they were each of the last couple of years where, where like yeah. Nimmo's probably one that some people have the least faith in because it's, it's weird for us to realize Brandon Nimmo's like an all-star caliber player at this point. Like so one of the, good. one of the three to five best left fielders in all of baseball, but like that's where he is. And the JD Martinez, what? I've got beef. I've got beef real quick that I want to just lead your attention to ESPN put out their top 100 players rankings brand Nimmo was one ranked 91st behind kyle schwarber behind jeremy pena behind those players they were like he's one of the most underrated players in the league i'm like and you're doing it you did it again 91st behind schwarber and jeremy pena are we crazy do you think that's bad sny oh, what's, today what's worse? on tuesday ranked top 10 players combined between the mets and yankees rosters and brandon Nimmo was not on it that's the the mets broadcast yeah didn't have mm-hmm. one of the best players on both of these two teams ranked as who made it ahead of him? Who made it I, ahead of him? Real quick, I don't do know if it was Mar- Martino list? or McCarran. Maybe you can try and find it right now, but I saw it while I was I'll scrolling earlier today. But it was Starling Marte was the 10th guy on there ahead of Brandon Nimmo, which is but ahead of Brandon Nimmo. You don't know anything about baseball if you think that's true, but painful, painful. But again, now you have to have those guys do what they have to do. And I think all of those guys could even be better than they were last year, besides Martinez, because he's not going to be hitting behind them. Um, wow. Mookie Betts and Freddie Freeman anymore. Like sometimes you bets and you're you're, you're a free man, but that's gonna be different. But he's thinking still could still be okay. He could still be okay. He could still be totally okay. But those four guys just probably combining for a clean, you know, four hundred RBIs, hundred twenty homers, hundred forty homers. That'd be awesome. But then I think the big part of this Mets lineup, like you say, being a top ten lineup, comes from the next section of the lineup: Alvarez, Marte, McNeil. Though, and Beatty, those three guys right there, because there's a lot of outcomes for those four guys right there. Like Brett Beatty could do anything from what he did last year to being like a guy who's 20% better in the league, average 25 home runs. Jeff McNeil's on base percentage could literally be anywhere from 380 to 280, which would be a drastically different player. Starting Marte, I have no idea. He was so pitiful yeah. this spring, and he's there's a good chance he's the DH on opening day, it kind of feels like right now, based on the way they align this roster, just because. Not putting Viento sub means you probably put Tyrone Taylor in the field, which means you probably put Marte in the bench where you're going to have a light hitting DH in the seven hole. It's going to be miserable all year. I hate that he's on this contract with his team. And it's just, then Al- then it comes down to Alvarez, who's probably the one with the most ceiling, but also I think that, and we're part of this, we're probably overrating him a little bit. He was what, a 290 on base percentage guy last year. Like if he, if he can't get that on base percentage to 320, like then it's suddenly he's like, okay, we still really need a step for you to become someone who's actually a difference maker in this lineup. And maybe two of those things happen. Maybe three of them happen. Maybe four of them happen. Maybe none of them happen. But like those four guys are the ones there's where there's a lot of motion, a lot of wiggle room, a lot of ceiling and not a lot of floor. Yeah, and a guy like Alvarez doesn't have to take as big of a step forward if Marte, if McNeil, if Beatty, like if these other things in this lineup happen. And bringing in J.D. Martinez does also give Alvarez like a little bit more cushion of like, I'm not here to now be the second best power hitter on this team. Like I am here 
to be like the six hitter, the five, whatever it's going to be. He slots into the lineup with like a little bit less pressure for the 22 year old. But yeah, like there are still things, even though I just said they're a top 10 offense that is relying on bounce backs and guys getting better. Like Brett Beatty, we love him on this podcast, but in his 400 major league at bats, he's been bad. And granted, yes. he finished spring strong. He has looked good. We have all the faith in the world on him in him. And again, maybe it's our fault for overhyping guys, but he does have to play better. Like it's mm-hmm. been a black hole at third base for the last couple seasons. Marte is Marte is the that's the problem. I think that's the real problem right now with this lineup. Harrison Bader, we knew is not going to hit at, like at all, pretty much anything that we get out of him is a bonus because he plays such elite center field. But right now we are in a world where I don't know what Starling Marte does for this team to a point where like come May, if he's, if he's hitting 210 and he looks terrible, like how much longer does he stay on the roster realistically? He'll, he'll stay on the roster because you're, I don't, I don't know how much more dead money we're going to eat. We're finally getting out of all dead money and we're just going to do it again right now where it's like, at some point you might just have to humble him and be like, Hey, now like you're Tyrone Taylor and Tyrone Taylor is you, or Maybe, now yeah. you're Trace Thompson and Zach and Drew Gilbert is you. Like, cause if Drew Gilbert comes out and he hits for six weeks, he rips apart triple a with all his college experience as good as he was last year and everything he can bring this team. And like as an engine, that lower, but lower part of the order, it's like, it'll be hard to keep him off the field. If you're, if you look at Stalin Marte and you look at Drew Gilbert and you're like, okay, this one guy is better hitter. He plays better defense. He tries harder. I, it's going to be hard to say, not, I'm going to play the other guy who does all yeah. those things worse like that. But we're not there yet. We want to get there. I also, I quickly want to call to attention two things that have been hap- happening this week from Mets Twitter. That one, our boy Jordan hit me up. He's a, he's a huge baseball nerd. He loves bats. He loves bats. Yes. And he sent me a DM about a week ago. And he said, I'm nerding out a bit, but Jeff was using a Proxer knob bat versus no knob bat. The Proxer typically oh. increases bat speed, creates more whip through the zone versus usual no knob, which is known for being great for bat control. It could just be a one-off at bat spring training experiment, but there's probably a deeper adjustment he's making up in general. He choked up a crap ton last year since he was using the 35-32, so he had a bigger barrel. I'm going to try to find the size of this one. And I said, please give me more bad analysis whenever you have it. And then do the I, next set, then he hit me up yesterday. Out the DMs and, and hit up Jeff and be like, did you change your bat? Are you doing something different? Yeah, hit <laughs> him up about the, the, Nox, the, the Proxer bat. Then he hit me up yesterday, Jordan, and was like, update. Now Jeff is swinging a bat with a puck knob. So knob watch on Jeff McNeil. But it's clear that Jeff McNeil seems like he's making knob adjustments watch. to knob watch. can't say that. <laughs> yeah, we can't say anything we want. Oh, Sorry. Oh, it's our, our UK show. viewers <laughs> know what knob watch means. Uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I, that's our second most popular country, which is awesome. We're 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 a top we're easy, always a top ten podcast in the UK. So shout out to UK uh, listeners right there. We love you guys. Shout out you too, Darren, especially. But I guess Rosie too. Maybe she's tuning in once in a while, just not telling me. But shout Rosie. It's, it's, <laughs> shout out Rosie. It sounds like sometimes that it sounds like Jeff might be making a concert conscious adjustment here to I want to hit the ball harder, which is a good thing for yeah. Jeff because he could probably can control always. almost any single bat. Like that's his thing. But if he hits the ball harder, and he's had had a couple more hard hit balls this spring, and then second one. In, it was in the Mets Twitter community. It was on Mets Reddit. Yeah, Alvarez for life. San Diego Ovation, Brett Bailey on opening day. Some Mets yes. fans were poo-pooing it. I'm going to be there on opening day. If anyone's going to be there on opening day, hit me up. Let's, let's know. What? Who's poo-pooing it? Why would you poo? People, like, oh, people poo-pooing the, it left and right. That's cringe. That's the, not the right. Fucking, He's never done anything to deserve it. The me. fucking assholes. Who? This guy plays for the team that you root for. Why do you not? Everybody should get an open, uh, an ovation on Stan Diego. Well, oh, a standing ovation on opening day. I was bad English. I was getting so excited because yeah. I want to yell at people. I haven't gotten a chance to yell at people in a while, and I've got a lot to yell about today. But why would you not want to give the kid a standing ovation? He hasn't done anything. He's 24. He hasn't had the opportunity. He had 400 at bats. He said, this kid fucking sucks. Pff, fuck him. I'm not going to stand for this loser. What is wrong with you? Why would you not want to give him the best environment to succeed? Did you not see those fucking asshole Philly fans stand and cheer for Trey Turner and see what it did for him? You you think you're better than those pieces of garbage down there in the asshole of New Jersey? I mean, come on. Like, what are we doing? Even Lindor made a comment. They're like, yeah, it sometimes it definitely wears on us at a team when we get booed in our home ballpark. Like, it feels really good to be cheered for. I'm very excited to just cheer cheer my balls off for Brett Bailey on opening day because he's be a doing big it part of this team. And we, we need him to be good. Brett Bailey being good not only changes the outlook of, of the team in April and May and June, but it will change the outlook of this team in 2025, 2026, 2027. Because b- behind, behind Brett Bailey, the, the, that's it. He's the third baseman. That's why he's getting his <laughs> second chances because for a couple of years, they were like, he's going to be our third baseman. And looking forward, there's not another option coming up here. There's no real prospect to push him. We've seen now what this organization thinks of Mark Vientos. And it's it might be less than a lot of you guys think of him, but it's not very highly. So it's just this is this is it. So without Brett Beatty now, a big chunk of the spending money in the next couple of years has to go yeah. to someone who can play third base. You know where I want that money to go? Juan Soto, Pete Alonso, Juan Soto. Corbin Burns. 
things that are much more fun and much more exciting rather than like yeah. Alex Bregman is going to hit 20 home runs for $28 million. I, they, it, Brett Beatty being good is so important. And if as fans, so. if we even think that we have like a 3% chance, a 1% chance to impact that, you know how cool that would be? We we could make be Brett awesome. Beatty good. We can have, that's pride. I want to make Brett Beatty good. And that we're, we're, we're prepped as a Brett Beatty podcast has been forever and always. Shout out Brett Beatty. And we're going to continue to support him. But that is, I think him and Alvarez specifically are the... Those are the guys. If those guys, and I guess Edwin Diaz, because he just has to be back and be himself and be everything we yeah. think he hope and dream, everything he looks like. But getting huge contributions from Bathy and Alvarez, and again, like a good step for Bathy is like a hundred WRC plus guy and not making the average. A ton of errors. Like being Alec Bohm for Brett Bathy makes this team <sighs> like hell yes. But look, Brett look Bay- what being Alec Bohm did for the Phillies. He went exactly. from being dog shit to being okay, and they were like, we could win the World Series. I'm not saying Literally. the Mets are there, but they Phillies. That's what changed. Yeah, we, we probably need Wheeler and Nola for that to happen, but I like where your head's at. Yes. Totally, yes. Right, yeah. right on right <laughs> on the money there. But like, if Bailey becomes like a 110, 115 WRC plus guy, 25 home runs, if Alvarez hits 35 home runs with a 350 on base percentage, we suddenly now, it's two positions. You know what we can say, Mets fans? You don't have to think about them until for, yeah. forever, basically. Never have to think about till, those Until 2030. Literally, that's it. Now we have two guys who are free and good and fun and likable and awesome. And again, Alvarez right now is significantly ahead of Bailey. He is Lisa Nagaib. He is different. Like he is built, he is cut from a different cloth. He could do things that nobody else can on the baseball field. But those steps, and even the moderate steps, league average for Bailey, 320 on base percentage from Alvarez. That's what we're shooting for. That's what projections have them at. That's the 50th percentile outcome. We do that. Everything for this team changes again, not just this year, but next year, the year after that, the year after that, the year after that. It compounds and it keeps getting better. Yeah, I, I mean, listen, I'm like I said earlier, I'm cautiously optimistic about this team, and we've said it on every single episode. Going to be a lot of fun Mets baseball. If you if you love baseball, this is going to be a baseball season, and these are the little things that you'll be able to watch on a day to day basis. See Brett Beatty hopefully grow and get better as a player. See Francisco Alvarez turn into maybe one of the more elite power hitters in Major League Baseball. Maybe we see Tyler McGill take that step forward. Maybe Christian Scott, Mike Vassell, Jose Budo, they come up and they make an impact. Like These are the things that, while is not what a World Series contender is necessarily looking for, like when you look at the Braves or the Dodgers, that's not they're not like, man, I really hope our young players are okay. But like for a team like the Mets that is on the fringe, that is the difference between being a fringe team and being a playoff team for them right now. And that's the kind of stuff that we need to happen. And if you're a Mets fan at home, fucking cheer for the team. Please, please cheer for these kids. There's no reason. If one of the, if they dog it, if they don't give a shit, that's different. But they're busting their ass every single day. And we did have the unique experience of being inside the organization for a couple of years and seeing it firsthand. And I can promise you, there is nobody who doesn't care. Everybody from the top down cares about winning, cares about playing well. And especially these young guys like Brett Beatty and Francisco Alvarez, I think it means a lot to them to, I mean, it, this is their career. This is to make a break year for Brett Beatty. He wants to be a major league baseball player, show it. And I hope we can see that. Yeah, Will Salmon had a good piece on The Athletic on Tuesday about that. He's very aware he's getting a second chance just because he there's almost no replacement for him. It's just like, I have to yeah. be better. He believes he'll be better. And it does a lot of this start with confidence. We talked about like, Brett Bay just seemed like it was a snowball last year. It seemed like the bad defense went back into, into the box with his bad offense and the bad box went back in the field with his bad defense. Probably seemed like he wasn't supported very well by his coaches. He wasn't being positioned well. He didn't have a great approach to the plate and everything just kind of went out of control as the team spiraled. And that was it. But Apart from those guys, then the other things that I think could like really catapult this team, be like the meteor that takes this team to the playoffs. Like it's all things that aren't that crazy if they happen. Like what if Luis Severino throws 150 innings? He's been so good this spring. He's been, He's so, been so good. Awesome. He's throwing 98. So good. The new changeup is incredible. The slider's still awesome. He's mixing in sinkers because the fastball shape isn't like as elite as it once was, but still pretty good. So it's like these are weapons against lefties, which was his big struggle last year. Like that. It'd be like, I'm not, it's so weird that I'm in a world right now where I'm not even worried about the, the effectiveness of Luis Severino, but it's the health. That's exactly what David Stern said like three months ago when we signed, four months ago now, where David Stern's like says these things and we should probably all listen to him a little more. It seems like he speaks a lot of truth and he's very, uh, he's very contrite. He's very articulate and he's very exact in the way he speaks about this team and all this stuff. He was like, yeah, we, we love Severino's stuff. It's just a matter of health. And right now he's healthy and we think we can keep him healthy. A, B, C, D, bang. Now we're in it. We're at opening day. And as of right now, as of recording, he still definitely is. So let's just keep that thing going. What if, like, what if, again, all these bullpen pieces that we've been just championing this offseason, like, what if when Fujinami comes back, it's all ready to go? Brooks Raley, another good year. Like, what, like, what, what if these things happen? What if Jorge Lopez gets even 70% of his form from two years ago? Like, if some of these guys click, if some of these good things happen, like, maybe you don't want to hear this fifth year 
Drew Smith. What if, what if there's this little step? Like, what if he just throws the fastballs and it is not? Drew's it our get boy. I want to hear it. Drew. Yeah, I'm talking about the other people. All the other people listening. The, the you know all the people in the interwebs. But like, they're they just some of these guys. Just a little bit of pop in that bullpen. From this bullpen going from one that we're like, all right, it's probably one of the bottom third bullpens in the league that's being held up by the best closer in baseball. What if it just becomes the 12th best bullpen in baseball, baby? That's all we want. 12th best. 12th best. 6th best in the National League. 7th best in the National League. And we're storming towards the postseason. Maybe not storming, but we are we are drifting into a wild card spot. Yeah, I I, I like to temper expectations. And like when people ask me, like, you think the Mets are making the playoffs this year? Even in my like season predictions video, I said no. But it's, I, we've, we've been too high. We've been too excited. Like, I want to be surprised this year. I would love to be wrong about the Mets not making the playoffs. And right now, the projections do say that they're not going to make the playoffs with that 81 wins. Close. But as we're telling you right now, they're so close. And those few things that could go right here, there, everywhere, whatever it's going to be, even some of the young guys that we've mentioned that could come up, like, We've talked a lot about the guys who are on the roster right now, but even looking back like at the minor league depth, the Mets haven't had minor league depth like they have right now in, what, 20 years? I mean, ever in our lifetime? I was talking with my dad about it. And shout out Stanley Consuegra. Now, granted, he's not going to make the majors this year. He's a far away thing away. But my dad's like, watching these the, the end of these spring training games towards the end of the season, like the, you've been used to the Mets having like these like lifelong minor league, for lack of a better term, bums that are like 33 years old, Go being like getting their last chance, getting a couple at bats. But now you're seeing the Mets are like Ryan Clifford, uh, Alex Ramirez, Drew Gilbert, Jet Williams. Like these are the guys who are now getting the opportunities. They have real depth, and especially on the pitching side, there's a lot of depth there. But back to Can Stanley Consuegra, some guy you've never heard of, hit the second hardest ball in all of spring training. The whole thing. Pretty fucking sick. Pretty fucking sick for like a guy who's now officially on the radar. Even like. A totally the opposite of what you said, but in the same ilk. Like even the boring thirty or something year old guys we have at AAA now are better than they've been before. Oh, G Man Choi took yeah. his outright assignment. That's a major league baseball player. Jose Iglesias took his outright assignment. That's a major league baseball player. Trace Thompson's down there. There's uh but Zach Short made the team, but like even Vientos down there. Like, oh my God, someone just bumped to an ankle. Mark Vientos doesn't come up and hit you a home run when he runs into one. He can. And again, same with that pitching. Like it's Lucchese's down there. He's gonna get innings this year. Vassal Hamill, Christian Scott are all guys who have over 150 innings in the uh, 100, 100 or at least 120 innings in the upper minors, and they all seem like they can pitch in a major league baseball game today, tomorrow, or the next day if you need them to. And this might be the first time in literally our lives that the Mets AAA team is over 500. Besides maybe Could 2012 be. when they had like Wheeler and Harvey on that team together, where it's like okay, these guys <laughs> can actually play a little bit, but it's a real thing that we've never experienced, and that's kind of boring shit that you guys are probably like, this isn't super exciting, but those that's a lot of times the difference between the teams that go far and the teams that do not. Like the fact that last year the Rangers, a team that is a weird case because it was so much happened developmentally and so much happened with them in free agency. But if you look at that team and you probably have some of the guys locker room, like how do we make the world series? They're like, man, Dane Dunning gave us 170 clean innings. And we thought he was <laughs> such an afterthought in the off season, a guy they traded for who was bad from the white Sox, And he was bad with the Rangers and he developed new pitch and a color and a two seamer. And he got his whole, his game planning, right. And suddenly like he's pitching every fifth day for them. Like things like that have to happen. It's a war of attrition Jonah in major league Heim. baseball. 162 games so many people are going to play in this team and we're going to do a little draft uh, at the end of towards the end of this episode me and mark and i are going to pick five guys each and the only things they're going to be scored on are played appearances and innings pitched guys not in the 26 man roster on opening day and then we're going to figure out something for the winner and loser at the end of the year but it's just like that's something that this team has not had in a while and it's cool that we have that but now we got to talk about the other stuff what could ruin yes. this team what's going to make this team win 74 games 73 games because we, we talked about the positive we got to talk about the negative because this team is definitely not without flaws this team is not this team is not without a low floor like things can probably go wrong for this team i think the number one thing that would murder this team is if Kodai Sanga has to get the full on rotator cuff surgery if he does not come back this season and misses part of the next year that would be a knife in my chest that would send me into a death spiral truthfully yeah Outside of like any like major injury, which like you can't can always that, that's any team you yeah you talk about with any team like oh if if Aaron Judge uh, breaks his leg the Yankees are screwed yeah of course like you would be too if that was your team so it's I mean, like ask Mark I'm not going to talk if Francisco Lindor breaks his leg <laughs> that was his favorite comment that he told us last year that got cut from the interview but uh, yeah like if Senga in terms of things that are like actually around right now if Senga's arm is dead or whatever's going on there not making the playoffs. It's probably not possible without him. And that would be a killer. There's no inclination that that's the case by any means, but as more and more days go on and we have no information, I, I can't pretend like I'm not a little bit worried. Like it definitely scares me that a guy who's so vital to this team, we don't really know much about what's going on. 
especially for the severity of what this injury could be. Like, if he has to get rotator cuff surgery, like, they, I don't know, there's like, wow, 25% chance that we just saw the only good season he's ever going to pitch in his major league career. Like, yeah. this is what Sixto Sanchez had, and he missed five years. Granted, different situation, <laughs> but it's just like, he's just coming back now as a chubby reliever, where he was like a top prospect in 2019. But it's just, Rookie that's of the year, bad. Dark Horse. Yeah, there it is. Watch him, 20 saves for the Marlins. Check it out in your deep fantasy leagues. But it's just that, it's on the table. And it was something that was a concern when the Mets signed him. That's why he was so cheap. People are like, can't believe he's $15 million. Yeah, it's because there's provisions in his contract for elbow injuries. <laughs> like he, he's had, he's been nicked up before. And it's a weird thing. Like it's not really being talked about right now because as Kode might begin re- like rehabbing soon and throwing, the Mets have a clear incentive for him not to pitch as long yeah. as possible this year because he needs 140, it was, or 160 innings, whatever this. He needed 400 innings in three seasons to have an opt-out after the third year of his contract. So if he doesn't reach 400 innings in three seasons, suddenly the Mets just signed Kodai Sanga to a two-year, $30 million extension. That is a really good reason to keep a guy, you know, make sure you're good. Make sure you're good. June 1st, July, all-star break. Just come back for the all-star break. Get get you 80 innings this year, then we'll be okay. But there's a, oh, it was 240 innings. That's what it was. It was 160 last year. Yes. And he's 240 more for the option, to uh, for the opt-out to kick. So that's a real reason for the Mets to be like, this isn't that special of a team. But maybe just this year, the innings, take it easy a little bit. But again, all that probably is still to avoid the, the worst, which would be full-on rotator cuff surgery. It would be horrible. Yeah, I don't think that there's necessarily this grand conspiracy of like the Mets being no, cheap me and being like, we need to limit his innings. But there's that's definitely something that is real and is, is thought about probably at some point. Briefly, do want to say that the Mets officially released Phil Bickford today. I think that was the, that was the roster move for J.D. Martinez officially for the 40-man roster. And uh, the Mets did, yeah, poor, poor one out for Phil Bickford. God, but never forgotten. Same with Luke Voigt. Got cut. Got goodbye. Our, our fallen Best king. Easy king. Our, our bicep king. But the Mets pulled the same bullshit that the Giants pulled with J.D. Davis on Phil Bickford, where he won his arbitration case for nine hundred grand. And he's walking out with a league minimum money. So that's like, it's different because the Giants cut J.D. Martinez, where J.D. Martinez, J, I keep doing nope. J.D. Davis. Where the Giants cut J.D. Davis, where J.D. Davis should be on that roster. He's better than other people on that roster. Where Phil Bickford is worse and has performed worse. So I don't hold it as much against the Mets, but sucks that the guy wins an arbitration case, but the, the contract's not guaranteed because it's an arbitration victory, not a defeat. And players' yeah. unions can have to answer this, but it's just that that was a weird thing I noticed. Again, I don't think it's the Mets' fault. He won the arbitration case, but he was always on the razor's edge of this roster. But the fact that it does happen is like it's kind of crummy. Yeah, super shitty. There's no doubt about that. He's gonna get picked up by someone else though, so he'll he'll get paid by somebody else. Like it's not not the end of the world. He'll still be okay. Philly B for three times. Bickford will never die. (laughs) Never. (laughs) Phil Bickford will never die. Never gonna happen. But yeah, like some of the other stuff too that could definitely derail the season a little bit too. The 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 young guys that we mentioned being good. If Alvarez stays the same, if Brett if Brett Beatty stays the same, that that's gonna hurt because then that becomes. I won't say the catching hole or catching will become a hole because he's still going to give us 20 home runs, I think, in his worst. And that's mm-hmm. way better than we've had in a long time. Totally. But it will be very, very hard for Brett Beatty to be a black hole at third base offensively, especially with a guy like Harrison Bader in the lineup who we expect little to nothing out of. And if Starling Marte is not good, which is seems like a real possibility. Yeah, and also if just if something doesn't click back with Jeff, I think it will because Jeff yeah. is always has this like he's like this he's this pendulum that swings back and forth and he plays baseball like even not year. many other what yeah big year even year but very different than most other people play baseball even and in the last like twenty years of baseball in general the, and I I love Jeff McNeil to death I'm happy he's like one of I think the seven guys under contract on this team for 2025 right now which is really hilarious to say out loud but it's just there needs to be again of those four guys two people basically have to take a step. Two people have to get to like a three four the on base percentage, like the number I'll give for those guys, and then like then you're cooking. But if only one of them or none of them get to that point, suddenly this this order is not very long, not as long as Mark would like it, and then now you're kind of in trouble after you get past JD Martinez. Yeah, we know I like it long. Um, <laughs> the, the the other I think major elephant in the room to talk about is, and you you kind of hinted at it a little bit with uh, seven guys under contract for 2025 is if the Mets are in that no man's land and not playing particularly great baseball, there's the real possibility that you start to trade off some pieces. And one of those pieces would be Pete Alonso. You have to assume he would be someone that is considered. I think Jeff McNeil is also someone that would be considered uh, as that you'd be trading off. You trade off every single starting pitcher and bullpen arm that you could possibly get rid of as well. That would completely derail the season too, is if they limp into that trade deadline and don't look kind of like they did last year. Like, if you go hot into the trade deadline and you're like, oh, this team's starting to pick it up. Kodai Sink is back. This is what they've been missing. 
I don't think they do that. But if you limp into it like they did last year, are they really a playoff team? Can they finish the, the second half of the season 10 games above 500? That's something that I think the Mets, and we've now seen with proof of last year, they're not afraid to go ahead and make the moves to continue moving forward rather than attempting a Hail Mary shot. Even the opposite. It's a shitty reality, but we've seen teams that are in within playoff reach for the last few years still sell because it doesn't fit the front office's plan of attack. I don't think the Mets would do this. I think the J.D. Martinez signing is a signal that Correct. that likely will not happen unless things are like quite bad. Like I think if we're in no man's land, we might just not buy, but I don't think we sell hard. We might sell something okay. if something really good comes to the table. But two years ago, a guy on this team, like we saw the Orioles who were in in opportunity to get a playoff spot for the first time in a decade since since the ghost of Buck Showalter left their dugout, trade their closer. At the time, it was their closer because it was before the Felix Bautista awakening. And again, it's ironic because that did happen. And same with Trey Mancini, who was like an organizational hero. Since Trey Mancini left the Baltimore Orioles, he has like a 500 OPS. And that Jorge Lopez trade netted the Orioles' Yenier Cano, who's now become one of the five, ten best relievers in all of baseball. So things that – that'll be some that'll be a real stress test for what this Mets fan base and a conglomerate think of David Stearns because we've seen moves like that work out for teams. We've seen moves like that not work out for teams. A couple of years ago, remember when the Red Sox pulled Tommy Pham for no reason when Hein Bloom was really nervous about his job. But it's just there's – there's there's this weird no man's land the Mets are probably going to exist most of the season in, and we haven't we just haven't been with David Stearns enough yet where we know what he's going to do when he was with the Brewers in no man's land there was a different budget but a couple of years ago he traded Josh Hader which that was that did not go over well in Milwaukee that kind of seemed like it was the beginning of the end for a, an era of prominence for the Milwaukee Brewers but we just don't know we haven't seen them do it yet we haven't seen them try but I don't, I don't know if we if we dump Severino because he's pitching decent at the deadline that just gives Mike Vassell, Jose Budo, or Christian Scott like full runway for a second half like that that might just be a net neutral and we might have got a prospect out of it but if we trade Pete Alonso I might throw a chair like I don't know there's something there's like something, yeah. there's something there's like something in between that where it's like I I don't I don't I don't know what's gonna happen it's like definitely like it's like five percent of anxiety but it's like totally overwhelmed by the excitement of opening day it's just something that we haven't gone through a season with this person leading baseball operations yet so we don't exactly know how he's going to act. No, we don't know. Um, and we know that he will do what he considers to be the best move for the organization moving forward. Cause you know what? He's not going anywhere. I don't think, I don't nope. think this is going to be a sure quick uh, BVW uh, situation where a couple of years and Oh, uh, shocking. An agent is not a good general manager to lead an organization. Who saw that coming? The Met, we can all agree, right? That they only hired Brody to try and get a good deal on his clients. Right. That was the only reason. No, it's because the one client was Jacob Degrom. I think we all know Jacob that pretty officially. Yeah, <laughs> and no, it's also I think that's probably sixty percent of it. But the other forty percent is the fact that the Wilpons were, for lack of a better term, stupid. And some guy with mm. slick hair and like the gift of gab walks in. It was like a hot shot with a nice suit. Yeah, and like you t t say what you want to say what you will about Brody Van Wagen. Like we've been in a room with him before. The guy commands a room. Like he's a big yeah. guy. He's always got the suits on with the sneakers with the white bottoms. He's he's a handsome guy. He's got that gel in the hair. Like he he'll command a room. And like he. That's probably a cool moment to signal the end of old baseball, where it's like, <laughs> it just, 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 it's like kind of like, like politics, where it's like, if you're, if you're a tall, handsome dude, you could kind of do anything you want in the entire <laughs> world, where it's like, now you might need an Ivy League degree, which is a good thing for sure. But it's just like, if I, if I say the three right words to the right rich asshole, like I can suddenly have any job I want. Totally. And I'm glad we're past it. I'm glad we have the Harvard man who was, uh, what, what was it? His mind was poisoned by those people up in Boston and at Harvard to yeah. trick him into trying to ruin the Mets. New York. I believe that's yes. what the post said. Yeah. 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 Probably true, but almost definitely not. But almost now we talked about, I think we basically mentioned every guy on the roster besides maybe a reliever or two, but I think, and uh, Omar Narvaez. So just shout out Omar Narvaez. Get that mentioned in for the episode. Shout out Omar. But shout out Omar Narvaez. Shout out Let's Tommy Pham. Let's see. I mean, bring him in. What's what we waiting for? <laughs> what we waiting for in Tommy Pham? Oh, no wait. Card. What? Hold on. Okay. I, I just want I want to throw this out there. Who will have a higher OPS this season? Tommy Pham or Starling Marte? As if Tommy Pham gets a job, it's not even a question. It's Tommy Pham. It's okay. not even. Okay. All right, all right. I, I think the last well, five years, I think maybe I think it's maybe four out of five Tommy Pham higher OPS than Starling Marte. Someone check me on that. But next thing here I want to talk about. I want you. I want you to give a bold prediction for the Mets season. It could be record. It could be performance. It could be something that somebody does. But I want something bold. I want something we're going to put on social media. Wow, something bold. All right. I mean, like, is, is Pete? I don't. Pete hitting. I'm, this, I'm not going to pick this one. But is Pete hitting 50 home runs? Is that bold? Is that count that's as a bold. bold prediction? Yes, that's bold. That would be a bold prediction. I just want to get my head in the space of what a bold prediction would be. Um, I'm going to go with that. The Mets. Ooh. ooh. Oh, I know what it's going to be. 
Mets score the most runs in the National League. What the fuck? Bold There's prediction. No... Bold that's prediction. I'm going right, crazy. I'm going crazy. Uh, that's that might be a little too bold. I don't think there's no chance of that happening. But let's try it. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say something much more chill. My, mine was gonna be that <laughs> Luis Luis Everino throws 150 innings with a three, three five ERA. That was my bold. Boo! That's not that bold. Boo! Kind of bold. That's that can happen. Bold, bold. Okay, fine. I'll give you a real bold one then. If you want a real bold one, then this is actually what I think happens. Uh, I think Brandon Nimmo finishes in the top ten of MVP votes this season. That's bold. That's, that's good. Bold. That's bold. That's bold. All right, let me think of another one then. Uh. You do a crazy one now. Do a crazy one because I did a crazy one, and then I came okay. back to James World. Now, go, now go to Mark World. <laughs> now, now it's going to seem like as you gave me the idea from exactly what you just said. But Francisco Alvarez gets an MVP vote. Oh, okay, I like it. I'll yeah. take it. That's good. Not not top ten an MVP vote. Top twenty five MVP. Yeah. yeah. On this baseball reference, well, you see you see MVP twenty three right there. You can't. You cannot talk to uh, our our friend Tim Healy and tell him to just write him in for one at the end of it. At the end of the season, that doesn't count if you're right. All right. Tim Healy's the one who wrote him in. We know you had a little bit of cahoots. Okay, I'll I'll do <laughs> a little bit of cahoots. I'll do I'll do one more then, and maybe this is me showing my hand a little bit for the uh, the prospect draft we're gonna have later. Uh, Drew Gilbert, 300 plate appearances the major league team. Ooh, that is a bold, bold one. I like that one it's as well. So, okay, so we got some yeah. clips now from TikTok and social media yeah. and everything. So, got the bold predictions out there. What else we got to talk about here uh, before we just kind of do our own stuff and, and talk about a little bit of some ga- good gambling picks? We did this a few years ago. It went well. Yeah. Uh, briefly, I want to talk about the David Stearns comments. We were just talking about Stearns. Would have made more sense. But just the fact that he – it was it was like a joke about what we were talking about last week that that dude on Reddit thinks he's like not really – um he's not really a Mets fan. I want to find the exact quote. He basically just – he was talking about how badly he wants to win with this team. Being like, I've rooted for this team my whole life. I've I've lived this team, I've died with this team, and I've never seen a championship. And, and a lot of people my age have also never seen a championship. And he was like, I want to be the one to bring it here. Like, I want to create something that that happens. And like that got me going a little bit. Like, I got pretty excited. Where I was just like, <laughs> let's, I want to see this shit too, David. Like, I'm also, I mean, we're we're not that different age of David Stearns, which is kind of fucked up to think about. But it's we just we want to do that. We really want to do that. And. Pete, uh, specific, specifically, shout out David Stearns for the J.D. Martinez contract. Huge shout out to David yes. and Steve. It's a huge message to the guys in the clubhouse, which is what I was alluding to before. But it's just the fact that we they, these guys want this shit. Like these are there are people in this club, club clubhouse locker room and front office right now who really want this. Like I think a lot of baseball executives, and this was like a big part of the Moneyball, the movie, are just like have to be a little bit detached from their team because you have to sign these guys cut these guys trade these guys send these guys down move them like to get them take like you have to do everything to these guys you almost have to treat them like just assets rather than people but he wants this shit bad and we all want this really badly too and maybe it doesn't happen 2024 but like there's there's a clear plan and there's process that's being put in place where i'm as confident about the mess team as i've have been for at least a decade if not longer i got a hot take about pete's comments you mm. ready for this yeah I think I think Pete's showing his hand a little bit. I think Pete, I think Pete wants to stay here, and I think hit, sure. the Mets signing JD Martinez for Pete goes. Oh, like we're gonna be good. They're not gonna trade me at the deadline because we got good players now. We're gonna we're trying to win. That means I'm gonna stay here. I think Pete's like, how can I pl- please, for the love of God, how do I stay in New York City as long as possible? I don't want to go to fucking Cincinnati or wherever he would get shipped off to. <laughs> it, it would be Anaheim. The only option would be Anaheim. But oh yeah, I, that's true. I, I I don't think that's untrue. And like depending how this year goes, we've, we've toyed around with the idea of having like um predicting the twenty twenty five Mets opening day roster episode. If the team's good, we probably won't get to that point. But if the team's bad, we definitely will get to that point. So you guys look be on the lookout for that. But there's just there's so much fluidity with this roster right now. There's so many things that can happen. There's so few guys under contract. The way that Stearns has built this team intentionally this year is that. Do you can move in any direction at any moment you want. There are almost no long term commitments that he's specifically assigned, and it's just they, whatever happens next kind of has a lot to do with what happens now. Like I, I think there's a general five year plan put in place, but I think this is someone who's yeah. flexible who will take who will take things other people say to heart, and that things will will and can change depending on how this team performs this year, especially the young players. And that's going to be, this year's going to be about Drew Gilbert. It's going to be about Christian Scott. It's going to be about Mike Vassell, Dom Hamill, Jose Budo, somewhat still not young anymore, but still guys who are arbitration eligible. Tyler McGill, David Peterson, possibly Jet Williams, possibly Luis on Cunha. All of this shit is in play right now. And I think it's really relevant to this, to the future of this team. 
Listen, we know David Stearns listens to this podcast. Uh, David, yeah, if you're course. listening to this current episode, I'm, I'm sure you are, as you always are for every episode, because you've seemingly done and agreed with us on almost everything that we ever say on here. But uh, maybe the next time you talk to the press, you sneak in like, oh, I had a great papaya for lunch or for breakfast, whatever it is. If you throw that into conversation, that'll be our little nod that you know we're listening, that you're listening to the Best Sub podcast. That being said, uh, you probably should turn it off now, David, because we're going to talk about a little bit of gambling, and we know you can't do that. So... <laughs> I went out and I found some uh, player props, some futures again from an unnamed sports book until they pay us. Uh, there's not that many for the Mets because there's just not that many players that you can really figure out how much they're going to play. But the big names are all involved. And uh, here are some of my favorites that I like. In terms of crazy bets, I really like Nimmo as the runs leader at plus 5,000. If he has a 360, 370 on base with Lindor, Pete, and JD Martinez hitting behind him, Plus 5,000, sprinkle $10 on there, win 500. That to me feels like a really, really fun bet that you could like not really sweat over. Oh, very honestly, I'm responsibly going to bet that after after this episode. That's an amazing one. That's Always up there with my that's up there with my Logan Gilbert lead the league and win 75 to one bet. That's that's my favorite bet I've ever placed in my life. If it doesn't win, I'm just I'm, I'm addicted to that to talking about that bet. <laughs> but otherwise, I think my favorite one on the board, just because of attrition, is probably Edwin Diaz to lead the league in saves. The way yeah. that we're seeing closers drop like flies, your boy Paul Seawall's injured, Joan Duran's injured, um, someone else got injured to close this weekend. But Josh Devin Williams Hader's, broke his back. Yeah, Devin Williams broke his back. Uh, David Bednar's dealing with a back. He's healthy for opening day. Just most of the upper echelon of closers in baseball are not healthy to start the year, which has sent fancy baseball drafts into a pure tizzy. And also the other guys on Edwin's level, I think you would say Josh Hader, who I'm, I feel like the Astros have so many options that they're probably just not going to use him as a traditional closer. I'm sure he's there to buy in. And the fact that they have Ryan Presley and Brian Abreu, who are along with Josh Hader, three of, I think, the 10 best relievers in all of baseball. Like there just might be some ninth innings that he pitches the eighth instead of the ninth because those two are righties and he's a lefty and you might just need to get a tough lefty out. But Edwin is the closer right now who is like, the most obvious to save every game because the Mets don't have a very good next option in terms of closing. They find relievers. They have no one else even in his stratosphere to take a ninth inning from him, depending on the way a game works out. And again, this team's going to be in a lot of close games. We're going to play good defense. We're going to get some timely hits. We're going to pitch reasonably well. I hope most of the time, like that's someone who do you remember if those Edwin odds were the top in the league for the most saves? No, that, that was third. I believe, I believe class a and hater were yeah, ahead of him. Okay. And then I think he was third. Yeah, so again, I think that he's going to just have more save opportunities than those guys because Class A, that team with the Guardians, shout out James Dolan's cousin. Wow, what a, what a disgrace that they'll never spend a cent because that was a good core <laughs> they always have and have again. Chase DeLauder in the minor leagues, he was like the best hitter in spring so training, good. so they can have Estevan Floriel on their opening day roster. It's just disgusting. But some of the way these teams, these people run these organizations. Thank God, again, we have an owner general manager who the week before the season when the team has middling expectations. They're like, let's bring in an impact bat. Grateful for that, Mets fans. But Otherwise, just it's a lot of over unders for our stars. I think that those over under bets are like scary to bet because you're basically just betting on people's health. But in terms of the numbers, they all look relatively docile. Yeah, like Alvarez is 22 and a half home runs. Fully expect him to hit more than that. Like uh, I'm an over guy on that. Francisco Lindor, 27 and a half home runs. I actually think that this might be the best line just because like hitting 30 home runs is a lot. And I don't really... I'm not like Lindor has to hit 30 home runs. Oh, if he hit 27 and did the exact same thing as he did last year, sign me up. Going to be a great season. Uh, that one feels tough. But then you have Pete at 42 and a half home runs. I, I think he should be over as long as he's healthy and he, you know, continues to do what he does. These are the ones I like here. I like the RBI stuff. Uh, Pete said RBI leader for the MLB, 850. And we mentioned that right now at the top of the order, the Mets do have two guys who get on base at a very high clip with Brandon Nimmo and Francisco Lindor. I, I really like that one as well at plus 850. He's like kind of like in that top five, top 10 range, I believe, in terms of uh, other MLB players. And to be fair, a lot of the other guys at the top, they have a lot of guys to spread around with. Like the Braves, there's only so many RPIs that Braves lineup can have because they have seven guys who are going to drive everybody in. Matt Olson's going to take away from Austin Riley, who takes away from Ronald Acuna. The Dodgers, like these lineups are loaded differently than the Mets lineup is. Last year, the Mets, again, objectively had a very bad season, and Pete objectively had probably the worst year of his career, and he was second in all of baseball in RBIs. There it is. That's what I'm saying. I think the year before, he was also second, but behind Aaron Judge. Like we're just, And again, like Pete's in a contract year, guys. He's going to want to play every single day, and now he's going to be in the three-hole. So like we talked about, more opportunities for guys to be on base ahead of him. That's it. Just get every first inning is coming up. That It's big, big time. He's going to have more at-bats, more opportunities, I think. And I like that one a lot too. It's just Olsen with Acuna is is the horrifying one. And also just, I think, 
and the Astro, but why not? Maybe maybe Judge Judge with uh you know with Juan Soto and uh, Clay Torres ahead of him, but he'll get hurt. Uh, he's already hurt. Like something yeah. will happen there. And Judge, I don't know. Nick Castellanos was eighth in the league in RBIs last year. What the hell? How did that even happen? He had a horrible year. Know. He had a horrible year too. He wasn't even good. He's also having a horrible spring. Terrible. But yeah. it's Agent it's weird. Why again? But yeah. Otherwise, it's hard. It's hard to bet these full season over unders. But if I had to do it, I'd like doing these ones where I like to lead the league so I can bet a little less yes. but get the juice back. So that Nimmo runs. That's sexual. And the Peter RBI, yeah. I think, is also fun. Pete and Edwards, I think those two guys probably should have first or second best odds, but they probably have something, like you said, Edwin three and Pete, like, four or five. That's value. Yeah, no, those are definitely good ones. And then you got Mets, 81 and a half wins. That's the one that's like, God damn it. I'm, I'm taking the over because we're Mets fans. But, oh, man, what a good line that was. They don't even give us 81 wins as a win. That's a loss. That's a killer. Yeah. I mean, again, it's also funny. I think these sports books get sharper and sharper as they get more and more embedded in society. Shout out Shohei. Shout out Jonte Porter. <laughs> um, and like this, the fact that the Mets win total is exactly basically what baseball perspectives and fan graphs has us at. It's, it's kind of a funny, it's almost a nod to them that Vegas, like we got football and basketball, baseball, you nerds have this shit so covered and the nerds and baseball yeah. have it so covered. It's the absolute best thing in the world. But my favorite one on the board, like you said, the crazy one, Nimmo runs leader, but then the Pete 108 and a half RBIs. If you want to play something safe, like just drop two units to get one back in October, get ready for football season. Like that's, that's, I think is the way to play that. <laughs> I like that. Get ready for football season. Drop two, get one back. <laughs> that's what, well, that's what I'm saying because that's what you would do right now. Because like, if you make a full season bet like this, you're getting this back week three, week four, week five of the NFL season. Like that's going right into your bankroll for football. So that's kind of what you're doing. I almost use future sometimes with gambling responsibly as a way to like have a low, have like a, it's like my gambling CD, my gambling mutual yeah. funds, where I'm just like I'm gonna put like twenty dollars into this future. I think I'm really confident that has like even odds. Like I did this with Lindor last year. I'm like he's gonna get this hit number, and I sweat it through the whole yeah. last two weeks of the year, and I did it two years. <laughs> ago with uh, Chris Kreider under in total goals um yeah I remember when I made that bet that was, that was a different time that's, that's kind of sad to talk about now but <laughs> um just like put a little bit down then like oh you get a little gift in your account like when uh when when, when everything comes back Texas Rangers win the World Series boy, boy smack that, that one smack that, was a little that gift. one last year I had the Nuggets win the championship I've been, I've been good with futures I got so I'm confident in my baseball futures this year but a lot of fun stuff from the Mets we got a lot of stars in the middle of this lineup now quickly a few minutes I want to do with you five guys each Play the appearances okay. and innings pitched for this team. Oh, we're going to keep track of this this year. And I want to talk about, we, we said we we're going to do a home run derby pool with the guys. Fantrax kind of kind of dicked me. I still love Fantrax as an account, but I was unclear of the way that, that rules were made. I probably need to talk to a developer ahead of time to get like a sponsored league. We'll try to do something like that next year. We got our boy Nick Kowal right now working on a Google sheet. That'll be much smaller because I'll have to do this by hand. So we'll probably only let like 50, maybe 100 people in it. But look out for a link either Tuesday or uh, Wednesday or Thursday morning if Nick can set me up with a set me up with a V lookup in time. But otherwise, we're just going to do this if you guys stay engaged because Mets have a lot of players in minor leagues that we're excited about who are going to get chances this year. And Mark and I are going to take five each right now quickly. So I thought of it. So I'll, I'll give you the first pick. Wow, you're going to give me the first pick in terms of players. I'm just going to steal the guy that you think to get 300. Wait. Does JD Martinez count? He counts, but I think that I think that would be foul play. If I'm gonna be honest. With you. Okay. 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 So <laughs> but you are we'll you just, are right. We'll, gentlemen's you caught me there. That really gentlemen's counts. Agreement. Yeah, yeah. Gentlemen's, gentlemen's agreement, agreement. We will not be taking JD Martinez or like the actual real major leaguer. If there's anybody else on there, um, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna get started offensively because we're doing plate appearances and innings pitched, right? Yes. So, okay. So, oh man, that is tough. Wow. I'm gonna go Drew All Gilbert. Right. Give me Drew Gilbert. Let me take him off the board for you. Yeah, I think Drew Gilbert is the absolute, he's the best first pick. So then I'm the only one to do then, coming back at you. I'm going to double up on pitching. I'm going Christian Scott, Mike Vassell. Ooh, okay. Okay. Christian Scott, Mike Vassell. Um, I, I, I was looking, I was really hoping you were going to leave one of them. I knew you weren't leaving Christian Scott. I was hoping you were going to leave Vassell. I will take uh, the butt man himself. I'm going to go Jose Budo uh, as Good. my next Good. pick. So I'll be pick number two. Pick number three. Where are we going here on this one? I'm going to go with, give me Mark Vientos. Give me Mark Vientos. I'm all about it. I was hoping I was going to sneak in with the next pick. All right, I got to look at this now. It's also relevant because we saw the Mets um, the other day put out there where everyone's going to be reporting. And some very cool things that uh, that Ryan Clifford's going to be with double A, that Colin Houck and Love Marco it. Vargas are going to be in high A, that Jeremy Rodriguez is going to be with St. Lucie. Lots of exciting things with this with this Mets team right now, where these, these minor leaguers could really start shooting up soon. We'll do some more prospect stuff, especially this year. We're working on trips to Binghamton and Syracuse to talk to these guys, so you guys can hear that. But I'm stalling. I need another pick now. This is gonna be the weird one. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Ooh. 
Yeah, I really wanted Vientos. I thought you were going to let Vientos go. I might. Oh, this, I think that one of the guys I'm going to take is going to be. Don't do it. I'm going to take Joey Lucchese. Okay, that's that's an obvious one, yeah. And then I'm going to go with. I'm basically right on the side between infielder and outfielder. Okay. And I think that is I'm going to wind up going with. This is such good podcasting right now. Good podcasting. Yeah. Such right. good podcasting. Jose Iglesias, infielder. Okay. Jose Iglesias. So you've got four picks now, right? Yeah, because then yeah. this will be my four and five. And I think I, I'm going to add a wrinkle to this. We're going to do one wild card pick, and it has to be someone who's in double A or lower. I think that has oh, to be okay. you know, one wild card pick. Okay. Uh, I'm going to take Austin Allen. I'm going to take the mm. left-handed hitting catcher in the minors, Austin Allen. One. I was looking I think, at him. I think that could be a... I think that could be a real, real sharp pick right there. Yeah. And then on the way back from my last pick of the AAA draft, essentially, ooh, I mean, I, I said it earlier in the year that I think he's going to get a shot at some point. I'll, I'll take Luis on Helicunia. I think he might, okay. might get a look at some point. All right, now, so again, with that, then I'll take my other AAA guy, Trace Thompson. And okay. then for, for my guy, this is going to be the sneaky one. For my guy yeah. below, oh, is he below? Is he reporting a AAA? Oh, I was going to do Nate Lavender. I forgot about Nate Lavender. Oh, he's triple A. That Damn, would have been we, a good pick. <laughs> we almost should go back. I, can I take him over over, uh, over Trace Thompson just because it's better for the podcast yeah. probably to have Nate Lavender? Right, go with him. Go with him, yeah. Nate Lavender is my last one. And then next one, sneaky, sneaky, sneaky. Sneaky. Paul Gervais. Ooh, Paul Gervais. Ah, dude, we're on the same wavelength here of thinking about relievers, of going with yeah. the reliever route for the guy. Is Gervais going to be triple A, though, or is he double A? I don't know. Let's check. If you you if you want if you want if you want to kill me right now, you can kill me. I'm looking, but yeah, I want I want to I want to I'm I've I've raised a question. I'm I'm concerned about that pick. Oh my god, we both we, we we both no we both screwed this up so badly. We left we left a pretty How? good one down there. We left a good one down there. <gasps> neither, of us, neither of us took Shintaro. Well, I th- I think I think that's a handshake agreement too. No Shintaro. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, because he's a major league. He's a major, major, major league. Yeah. Yeah, I think Gervais is gonna be triple A, so I gotta take that one back. Damn. Okay. Welcome back. Welcome back. Who do you want now instead? I don't even know. Oh, this is a weird one. All right. This is just a pure 40 man roster pick. This is a strange one. Alex Ramirez. Ooh, who's rep- okay. He's reporting like to double A, but he's on the 40 man roster. I got to look at the 40 man real quick now, too. I didn't even think about taking a look at the Mets 40 man roster to see who's in double A. It's like oh. the last one in double A. The only one double A in the That's roster. The... Okay. That's going to be tough. It's... Oh, yeah. Jet's not 40, man. You can take Jet. It's double A. Yeah, I know. I'm I'm thinking about Jet. I'm thinking about. I really I want to take like a weird reliever. Like I don't know why we've been seeing a lot of Wilkin Ramos. I don't know if he's any good, <laughs> but we've been seeing a lot of Wilkin Ramos recently in those spring training games. Uh, you know what? I'm just gonna I'm gonna take Jet. Give me Jet Williams. Uh, I'll take yeah, him as my final pick. pick. Yeah, I, we gotta go sexy. You can't go Wilkin Ramos. Guy might not even be on the team to start the year. Who knows? <laughs> All right, good stuff. But um. This is, not, this is the first time going over an hour in a while, and it feels cool. The season's about to start. Happy we're yep. we're finally here. We're finally at baseball. I'm, just, I'm so excited for baseball. God, I put out two monster Twitter threads on Tuesday just about like all the cool things in spring training, and I was just like, it's still not enough. Like I want real baseball. I want to talk about so pitch exciting. sequencing and, and fucking pitchers and sliders and stuff. But I mean, hey, like if you guys made it this whole hour, shout out you guys. Last thing we want to talk about briefly for a second. I th- weird, yeah, I think we're gonna one talk Twitter. about like. Mets Twitter. We're going to talk about, I think, just like a little bit of our plan, too. I know I said it briefly at the beginning, but like if you guys want to yeah. just hear like thought process about like everything that's going on with us and what's happening, we'll probably just kind of have that conversation live with you guys because why not? We want to keep you in the loop. But yeah, um, something interesting happened on Mets Twitter today. Uh, shout out Grant, Jenny Mets. He basically deactivated his Twitter account. We know that he's going on to work in baseball and other places right now. Uh, so he just doesn't have the time. And I'm sure he doesn't really want to take care of that while he's trying to actively get jobs and work for a, uh, uh, you know, baseball teams. Just work, work, working full time for social media gigs. Very hard. I've done it. It's, it's, it's very demanding. You do a lot of these minor league teams. They don't, they don't give a ton of support, but they give you an opportunity. So that's kind of what he's doing, which is great. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately for Jenny Mets, he has become a bit of a punching bag in the Mets community. And I think it's, unwarranted i understand why people do it because grant we love you but you definitely have at times taken content and not given credit and you've acknowledged it you've apologized and i think that's all you can ask for it's fucking twitter it's not that serious at the end of the day and to be fair everybody else on Mets twitter would do the exact same thing if they were in his position so everybody who thinks they're holier than now i think you should take a look in the mirror that being said 
he put out a tweet basically saying like he's ending his account. Thank you for the great experiences, great time, a lot of great memories, all that good stuff. Bittersweet. It's awesome. He's going on to better, bigger things. But also it sucks because he built something up and he really seemed to enjoy it. And he really is genuinely diehard Mets fan. Really good dude. That being said, um, there was some tweets put out specifically by the New York Mets, which I think were in bad taste. Um, and I just, it, it left a bad taste in my mouth. And we, whatever our platform is, Grant's a friend of ours, um, whether you like him or not, I don't think that was right what the Mets did. Um, and I think, I think it was a little bit of a low blow for someone who, at the end of the day, has been relatively nothing but positive to the Mets as a whole, Mets community, Mets fan base. Whether you like him or hate him for stealing the content, who gives a shit? It's, it's Twitter. It's not that serious. It's just when you're a multi-billion dollar organization and your season's about to start, to punch down is just kind of rude. It's just, it's just really not right. It's kind of disrespectful and it kind of like, I don't know. It's just, and, and it's even more ironic because like we, we, like we've been, again, we've been inside. We, we know a lot of people who work at social media, but their Twitter has always been kind of like just a very bland, plain thing. It's like they, they do birthdays. They, they, they talk about some podcasts besides ours. They will do, they will do, they'll do call-ups and call downs, official roster moves. And it, for, for an account with over a million followers, it gets relatively middling engagement. So then when you see that their most engaged tweet in months, million impressions is them taking a shot at a, a 20 something year old content creator who, again, again, like I, I don't think Grant, it's not like Grant put none of this on himself. Like there, he had stolen content before he hadn't given credit. He started giving more credit now, but it's like for them to punch down someone like that, especially when, I don't know, like they, like they, they Grant knows some people who run those Twitter accounts too. And it's just like, that's it's personal. It's disrespectful. It's mean. And it's just, it's just like everybody else. It's just someone trying to do something out there. Again, like, again, don't think he did it the right way all the time. Grant, you're listening. You're the man. You're still a friend. We love you. I, did, I say two separate <laughs> texts. Like, Congratulations for the job you got. And then, then oh my God, like that's the position I, uh, you want to take as an organization. They, they stay so above so many things. Mm -hmm. And this is the one you decide to take your shot at? Yeah, like at the end of the day, love him or hate him. I don't think that this was right. And then the thing that kind of really set me off and again, disappointed, disappointed because we, we know everybody and this just doesn't feel on brand. It doesn't feel right. It doesn't, it doesn't really make sense. The Mets started nice. liking the tweets about trolling him. And I was like, that's, that feels even ugly. Like, what did he do to deserve this? That's so mean. All he is is a diehard Mets fan who made some tweets that people got upset about because he used their content. If that makes you worthy of punching down with from a billion dollar organization, that's a little upsetting to me. I, th I think the people on Twitter, they have every right to punch up. Everybody's punching up. He's got 70,000 followers, which is fucking hard, by the way, on Twitter to build up that kind of following. Shout out to him. Fucking organizations around baseball should be interested in hiring this kid because he did it from the ground up. But for the team to then punch down and then like the tweets of the people making fun of him. And just like we we also know, because again, like we said, Grant's a massive Mets fan. He built up this following, built up his account in a very impressive way just because of how much he loves the team and how he's every time there's news, he's on it in moments. Like that's what you need to build an account like that. And it's like you're addicted, you're obsessed with the team. And we know from the inside the awkwardness of where there's a team you love, but then there's another relationship with it that you don't like very much. And it's a weird thing. Like I even just like again, now we'll talk about his podcast a little bit more before we go. Like I have some weird yeah. feelings like going on opening day this week. Like going into Super. that stadium for the first time in a couple of years, like without being that's like, I know I'm not being not welcomed in, but before it was like, yes. we could walk in we're saying hi to people. We're like, we're, we're part of the fabric. And then it just kind of happened quickly and unceremoniously that we weren't anymore. And now other things have happened since then that made it weirder for us. It's just, it's a strange feeling. So like for, I, I feel for Grant, I'm talking kind of to him right now, but just for the team that you love and that you've put so much into your life and that gives you so much positive emotion. Again, like the Mets, like fuck the Mets half the time because they love, they'll, they've choked, they've blown leads, they've had horrible seasons, but like <laughs> we still, we still all love the Mets because they're the Mets. Like I, I that's yeah. it. Like as, as bad as they've been before and as disappointed as they've made me on the field and front office stuff, not nothing now, like the old the old regimes, you know, Brady Van Wagner, yeah. fucking, Jim, fucking Jim Duquette, Steve Phillips, Wilpon days, our <laughs> how Willie Randolph with the Wilpons. It's like it, the list can go on and on. And we were we're in our late twenties, Grant's in his early twenties, but it's just like you have to be able and it's been hard for me and for us like to separate what happened Definitely. and what they still are and like that was something i was worried about as this was all happening last few months and we talked about it a lot but it's just maintaining like the joy and like frivol of baseball watching and mets fandom and even this for us and grant's content creation when you feel like there was something weird that happened and in grant's case something like I, they handled us much more respectfully than they did grant where yes, this is like way just much. really just really mean to him and i it's gotta be hard emotions for him and i just if he ever, if you want to reach out, like, let me know. I'm down to talk. Yeah.
Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, and in terms of like what we're going to be doing with the podcast this year, I know we talked about it briefly, still keeping everything with the same series. Going to still be going to games. I mean, the tickets are going to be cheap. Like it's yeah. They had a hard time selling out when the team was good in the playoffs. So the tickets are going to be cheap. I think um, there's like 50 bucks. And, yeah, I mean, we're going to get in get in for cheap, which will be nice. And we're still going to be around the stadium. So again, you see us, come say hello. We're going to be doing like a lot more content because we can now. Like as amazing, we were spoiled because we got to go to games for free and we were paid by the team and we had incredible access like that. That stuff is going to change for us. We're we're not going to have those same opportunities to talk to players, to talk to guys. It's going to be a lot of grinding on our side and hopefully making relationships with players whenever we get the opportunity to. Like I have with Jeff, like I got to cash that in now. I have to DM him rather than just walking onto the field and being able to talk to him. But Mm -hmm. Still plan on doing a lot. We're going to be able to have a lot more fun. Uh, when the team sucks, we're going to tell you they suck. When the team's doing really well, we'll still be super positive. We're going to be at the K-Corn. We're going to be at, at at Ebbs, if it's even still called that. I don't know what's going on. We're going to be having beers with you guys, doing content, doing trivia with fans. Like We just really want to make this podcast a lot more fun. And the really corny term that I've been using in conversation with James is like kind of just like build up like the Mets Up podcast like universe in a way of just – like, we don't want to necessarily only be a podcast that you listen to on Monday and on Thursday when series ends. We want you to come to our YouTube channel. We want you to come to our Instagram, interact with our stuff, see us at the game, have a beer. Like, whatever it is, we just want to kind of build that up because I think that's something that, unfortunately, we did lose a little bit going, you know, big big shot, big corporate uh, when we did join the Mets. Yeah, it's community. We want to build community. And again, shout out you guys for this because, like, since – the last couple months have been crazy. Like we basically been doubled awesome. our Instagram following. Our our reels are amazing. And shout out to both of us because we have some great ideas. We've had a thousand followers to our Twitter account. Still kind of stagnant there, but it's good. Like we've, I think even you and I, our personal pages, we've gotten better at because we kind of lost that thing that was hanging over both of our heads where it's like, we know that people are, for lack of a better term, watching us. And not that they shouldn't yeah. have been, but it was definitely a weird feeling. I, I mean, I felt it personally too. Like I started even working two full-time jobs and like trying to build up personal following. Like it's hard. There's a lot of stuff. You're running here, you're running there. You're doing things a lot of people tell you to where now your creativity finally feels like it's flowing again. And I'm excited for it to flow. And again, whatever happens with this Mets team, like we're going to tell you, like we're going to give you some stats, then we're going to probably tell you some jokes and we're going to say some bad words, but then we're just going to hang out. And yeah. most often than not, we're going to be asked to the field just drinking beer. Like that's basically the yeah. end of the day. What Mark and I are gonna, that's the end of the day is what we love to do. It's why I even started doing this in the first place. That's just like that. That's like the rank right there. Like city field drinking beer. Like that's what, that's what this show is going to be about. Like we want to hang out. We want to connect with you guys and we just want to make this as fun as possible because this is what we like to do. Like we got to stop doing this last couple of months because we kind of, we, we accrested a little bit. We flew very close to the yeah. sun and the wings certainly melted and things. It's been a real awakening, <laughs> real coming of the coming to coming to coming to grips moment these last couple of months, especially for me. Someone has been like, I don't even know what the fuck's going on in my life in general, but this summer, I just, I really just want to go to city field and have a beer. That's like all I'm looking forward to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, like you said, the reason we started this podcast was because we lived together and we were just like, we talk about the Mets for 30, 40 minutes a day on our own. Like, we should probably record this. And that's the feel we want to get back to. Because I think when we were doing the stuff with the Mets, again, we were limited on what we could say because we can't be like, oh, wow, like Max Scherzer really fucking sucks. Like, this guy really is shit in the bed. Can't say that because God forbid Max Scherzer hears that. And then we go on the field. Now there's a problem. Now we don't get to talk to anybody. Like, this was the kind of stuff that had to go through our head every single episode and that's kind of why we would have episodes before the episodes that were not recorded so we could get everything out and then kind of for lack of a better term bullshit you guys for a little bit but this season completely different the boys are back to actually talking about what's going on um i don't want to say being critical because i don't think that's fair but being fair like what is happening what our opinion is on things and at the end of the day like james said having a beer and watching some baseball because that's what it's all about so we're really excited for this season uh hope you guys are too a lot of great content coming at you Make sure you're following us on all our social media at Mets Up on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Again, the YouTube channel will have more than just the podcast episodes. So if you want to see that content as well, go subscribe to the Mets Up podcast on YouTube. The ones who have come over and watched seem to be really enjoying it. So we hope the rest of you join us over there. And if not, if you just want to listen to the podcast after every series, Apple, Spotify, Google, whatever it is, drop us a rating, drop us a review. We really do appreciate it. It does help us grow in the world of insane amount of Mets podcasts that exist out there. We got to be the team with the most podcasts, right? I don't, the Yankees basically have John Boy and like a couple others. I feel like the Mets have like nine. Yeah, and all the, all the Mets ones are like seemingly kind of even. <laughs> it's just like we're all yeah. basically the same and everyone seems like they're like listening to basically all of them, but they have very strong feelings about each one individually. But again, shout out you guys for choosing this one. We're happy you're here. We're, we're going to stay here. We enjoy doing this and 
let's go Mets. Like opening day, like there's a, again, it's a bit, definitely a bittersweet feeling. Our favorite word in this podcast for probably both of us with this season starting and having a different feel to it, both with the team and both with our own pursuits of sports baseball media. But it's just, it's like the Mets are going to be playing baseball that matters either on Thursday or Friday. Now, again, that's really the only important thing. Uh, and a little, little hint for those of you who made this long. I think we're going to do something called like, what do we call booze bucks or we're we're basically yeah. gonna spin off beer money a little bit, and we're gonna we're gonna do like a trivia game for you guys at the stadium. So if you see us with cameras, come up to us. You're gonna have an opportunity to maybe win some money. Get on get on our content. Be involved. So uh, thank you guys, and we will catch you all on the next episode. Peace out. Peace out. See you guys next time. Let's go Mets.